All right. Hi, everyone. We'll let everyone else just kind of come in as they do. Um, and but we'll go ahead and get started and um, and let's go. All right. Hi, my name is Brittany Kerfoot, the director of events at Politics and Prose Bookstore, and I'd like to welcome you all to PNP Live. A few housekeeping items to go over before we begin the event. I will be dropping links where you can purchase both authors' books straight from PNP's website, and I will be putting those in the chat feature. Um, and if you live in the DC area, you can select in-store pickup and come to any of our three store locations to get your book, or you can have it shipped to anywhere in the US. Also, if you would like to ask Sonia a question, please enter it in the Q&A space, which is at the bottom of your Zoom screen. And if you would put it there instead of in the chat, it's just easier to keep it all in one place and it's easier for Mega to find. And we will get to your questions toward the end of the event today. All right, it is now my pleasure to introduce tonight's speakers. First, Sonia Falero is the author of Beautiful Thing, Inside the Secret World of Bombay's Dance Bars, and the novella, The Girl. Her latest book, The Good Girls, An Ordinary Killing, is an ex exploration of how the mysterious deaths of two teenage girls shone a light into the darkest corners of a nation. The ensuing investigation into their deaths would implode everything that their small community held to be true and instigate a national conversation about sex and violence. Moderating the conversation is Mega Majumdar, author of the New York Times notable book, A Burning, which was also long listed for the National Book Award. She currently works as an editor at Catapult. So please help me welcome Mega and Sonia onto your screens. Hi guys. Hey, thanks, thanks so much, much Brittany. Um, and hi, Sonia. I'm so delighted for the chance to chat with you. You know that I loved your book. Um, and hi, everybody who's joining us. I just want to shout out the book that we're celebrating today. Sonia is brilliant, The Good Girls. Um, I stayed up really late reading it. Um, I think this is a book which is so moving. It was so fast paced. I just wanted to keep turning the pages and keep going with the story. Um, so it reads in many ways like the most fast paced true crime, but it has such a deep investment in social justice um, and in the lives of girls and women in India. Um, it's an incredible, incredible book, which you should all buy from Politics and Prose today. Um, but perhaps we can get started with you, Sonia, if you want to introduce the book in your own words and do a reading. Yeah, yeah. Mega, hi. Thank you so much for doing this. And hi to um, everybody who's joining us from wherever you guys are. Um, uh, let me start by telling you a little bit about the book. It is uh, the story of two girls, two teenagers, who I call uh, Padma and Lali, because um, I, under Indian law, I can't tell you what their real names are. Padma was 16, uh, Lali was 14. They were first cousins and they were also best friends who lived in a joint family of 18 people in a village in North India. It was a typical um, agrarian village. Everybody around them worked um, in, in some form of uh, agricultural activity. And like the adults, the girls also worked all the time. They worked at home cleaning and cooking. They worked outside the house, you know, grazing the animals, working in the fields from dawn to dusk. But like teenagers anywhere else in the world, um, when they got the opportunity, they would uh, escape for little bursts of freedom and talk and uh, do something that they really enjoyed, which was talk on the phone. And uh, it was during one of those little chats that they had on the phone that an event occurred that led to things that perhaps nobody anticipated and ultimately culminated in the death of these uh, very much loved children. They were discovered uh, one morning hanging from a mango tree in the village orchard. And what happened to them? How? how they ended up there is really the story of, uh, uh, of the good girls. So I'm gonna start by reading the first chapter. It's called, An Accusation is Made. 
Rajiv Kumar had a side job as a government teacher, but his real job was farming. While working his land, he had observed Padma and Lali. They were as alike as two grains of rice, and they spent all day in the fields. Now one girl, he couldn't tell which, had a phone to her ear. He didn't like it. Some villages in Uttar Pradesh forbade unmarried women from using phones. A phone was a key to a door that led outside the village via calls and messaging apps. The villagers were afraid of what would happen if women stepped through this door. They might get ideas such as whom to marry. Records showed that 95% of Indians still married within their caste and anyone who didn't attracted attention. In 2013, a young woman from Katra village took off with a man from a different caste. His father was so ashamed he couldn't show his face, people said. The woman had chosen to marry against his will, to have what was known as a love marriage, rather than leaving it to her father to arrange a partner for her. She had violated the honor code and would never see her parents again, for their safety and certainly hers. A few months after that, it was a turn of a girl from the next door hamlet of Jati. The news of the elopements moved like a swarm of whirring insects, landing first here and then there, until all the nearby villages were warned. Change is coming. Be vigilant. Be ready to act. In 2014, for the first time, the National Crime Records Bureau, which publishes the number of cases registered for crimes, published data on honor killings. 28 cases were reported in the country, but everyone knew the true number was hundreds, if not thousands more. Girls were killed for marrying outside their caste or outside their religion, and sometimes having premarital sex was reason enough. With the killing, the family's honor was reclaimed, or at least the other villagers were given notice that the family had taken the errant behavior seriously and done their best to right a wrong. The constitution had existed for only decades, while Hindu religious beliefs dated back thousands of years, said one father who was accused of killing his child. In Katra, the rule was that boys could own phones, but girls had to get permission to use them. Even so, but Lali knew what to do with a phone better than their mothers, who could identify neither letters nor numbers. Padma often called her maternal uncles, reciprocating the effort they had put into keeping in touch after their only sister, Padma's biological mother, had died. Lali texted her elder brother, who worked for a car parts manufacturer far away. The girls used the torch feature to light their way into the pit of the night. Rajiv Kumar didn't know this because he didn't know them. He didn't even know their parents beyond the usual subtique or well. But a girl's life was everyone's business. He was determined to do his duty. His plot was near some land owned by a close relative of the girls named Babu Nazruram. With his bowl cut, barn stained teeth and sloppy smile, Nazru was approachable. At 26, he wasn't that much older than the girls. They shouldn't be out in public with a mobile phone, Rajiv Kumar said, speaking in Braj Pasha, the language of these parts. Who knows who they are talking to? Although the fields adjoined the village, the walking distance from the Shakya house to the orchard was 10 minutes or more. The orchard wasn't even visible from the house, which was located in a spider web of lanes. Rajiv Kumar's implication was clear. The girls chose that particular time because they were alone. They chose that place because it was secluded. To remove any doubt, he used the word chakkar to indicate there was something crooked about all this, something off balance. The girls in your family are romancing someone. Nazru agreed that it didn't look good. You should let their parents know, Rajiv Kumar said. A few days passed and Rajiv Kumar again saw the girls talking on the phone. He again sought out Nazru, who explained that a complaint could backfire. The girls' parents might accuse him of slander. Rumors were butterflies, they might say. If word got around, who would marry Padma? Who would have Lali? Nazru understood that it was one thing for Rajiv Kumar to talk. It was another for a relative, a first cousin no less, to level an accusation of such grave seriousness. And there was the other matter to consider, which was that he depended on the family. Everyone in the village struggled. 
but he had an asthmatic father to care for and a brother people called crazy. The Shakya sometimes hired him to work their land. If things got truly difficult, they could be counted on to come through with cash. So Nasru said nothing. But mindful of his duty, he started to watch the girls. His behavior didn't go unnoticed. He ogles us, Padma said to a friend with disgust. It was while Nasru was keeping watch that he came across the spindly bobblehead boy. Katra village was small and Nasru knew everyone who lived there, but he didn't know this boy. The boy was grazing his buffaloes, so he couldn't have come from far. It was natural to assume that he was a Yadav from the hamlet next door. What's your name? Nasru shouted. Papu. The young man's name, in fact, was Dervesh Yadav. He was sharp-nosed with a shock of very black hair. People called him Papu because he was small, like a boy. Papu wore an oversized shirt and trousers, a hoop in his ear, and rubber slippers on his feet. Although his face was imprinted with apprehension, Papu's life was more secure than most in the hamlet of Jati. His father was a watermelon farmer who had accumulated enough savings to build one of the few brick houses in a settlement of shacks. Papu's mother doted on him, her youngest child. Although his parents' lives revolved around the sandy riverbank crop of their home, they didn't stop their children from finding work elsewhere during the off-season, picking through garbage for recyclables or hefting bricks on construction sites, even as far away as Delhi. And because of this, Papu had seen a world outside the one his parents were rooted to, a world in which roads were crammed with cars and not farm animals, where there were soaring buildings and ambitious men and women doing more than just the one thing, in the one way it had always been done. A modern India, where the burdens and entrapments that had kept generations of his family collecting cow dung could be swept away and forgotten. And although Papu didn't know anyone who had left the village for good, this new world was full of promise. Freedom was close. But Papu, although he was nearly 20, could only write his name. And he was expected to help support his family. They had a deal, father and son. As long as Papu contributed financially, he could do as he pleased in his free time. Nazru wasn't having it. If your animals eat all my grass, he shouted, what will my animals eat? Don't you come here again. That was incredible, Sonia. Thank you for that great, great reading. I think it just, you know, took me back into your book so beautifully. Um, one of the things that I first fell in love with in this book is how vivid all of your characters are, and certainly the two girls that we call Padma and Lali. Yeah. Um, you know, they like you said, they work all day, they have all of these chores, they help harvest mint, they go to a village fair. How did you bring Padma and Lali to life on the page? What was that process of interviewing and reporting and then writing them? What was that like? So, you know, I was uh, living in London when I first came across the case and, and I came across it the way that I think everybody uh, outside the village in urban India and elsewhere came across it, which was via a photograph on Twitter. A local reporter who happened to be in the village of Katra the day the children were found, took a photograph and put it on his Facebook feed, just mm. not so much as, um, you know, as, as a piece of news, but just because he wanted to update his Facebook feed with, mm. with just one of the things that he was seeing that day because crimes against women, um, all kinds of crimes were so common uh, in Uttar Pradesh and he didn't anticipate for a minute that this would attract uh, any attention outside of his immediate friends. But somehow that photograph migrated to Twitter and that's where I saw it, this picture of these children hanging by their necks in, in a tree. And um, I, was thinking about writing a book about sexual violence in India where I had grown up and lived all my life. And I looked at this picture and I felt, I think what a lot of us feel when we are confronted with these crimes over and over, which is what is going on? 
You know, who are these people committing all these crimes and why is it so hard to stop them? And if you remember, it was not even two years after the Delhi bus rape, uh, you know, at, at, during which a, a physiotherapy student who boarded a bus in Delhi thinking it was a public bus, but was instead set upon by six men who raped and tortured her and then threw her out. And she died a few days later in a hospital bed in Singapore. And that young woman who I also cannot name, uh, you know, her death galvanized the country, as you would remember. There were the biggest protests across India that we had ever seen mm -hmm. in response to virtually any event, let alone an event that concerned women's safety. And the government did respond with changes in the law and uh, with, uh, with huge uh, infusions of money uh, into, you know, care centers and support centers for women. But here we were, two, barely two years later. So I looked at that picture and I wanted to know more. And uh, I just wanted to know who these girls were. You know, because obviously when we encounter people in these circumstances, all we know about them is how they died. And that death, of course, as terrible as it is, uh, is, is just one part of who they were, right? Mm -hmm, it, mm -hmm. it defines them, but that was not life. So who were these kids and how did that happen to them? But by the time I made it to the village of Katra, a year had passed, um, and, make her, and I, I had flown down from London to Delhi. Then I drove six hours to go to Katra village. And you can imagine that the family was deeply traumatized and they had never been uh, uh, allowed to process that trauma because as soon as they saw the children, they understood that they would never know truly never know in a, in, a, in a way that satisfied them what had happened to the girls because they had a pretty clear understanding of how the criminal justice system works in India. And so they, they started the quest for justice right away. You know, so there were, they, they were the police and they were the investigators and they were the doctors. They were everything for their children in addition to being grieving parents. So I'm meeting people who are severely traumatized. I'm meeting people who are um, fighting for justice, but also mega, you know, people who in that quest for justice did and said things that were unjust to other people, you know? And that is something that I had to grapple with. And then there was a point, you know, just talking about the kids and, I mean, you remember what you were like when you were 16 years old. I, I, I'm sure you were lovely. I was not. <laughs> and I know that my parents were the last people that I confided in, you know. Um, so the kids had also died at a stage when they were unknowable to their parents, like teenagers tend to be, right? They, we, we have all gone through that stage where we have to disconnect for the sake of our own growth and independence. And so... Their parents adored them and knew them, but they didn't know them the way that kids know each other, teenagers know each other. And so I got a lot of, you know, she wanted to be a doctor and she loved studying. And those beautiful sentiments that Indian parents have about their kids <laughs> that are not true, you know? Mm -hmm. So build the story of these these teenagers, and I know I keep calling them kids because of course they are and they are for me, but for, of these kids, I, um, I had to speak to their friends and I had to speak to uh, Padma, the older girl who was 16, her maternal uncles, the, the, the brothers of her biological mother who had died when Padma was little, they were very close to her. Um, a cousin, a first cousin who was 12, at the time the girls died and had come from Delhi, uh, from a city outside Delhi to spend a week uh, with, with her cousins. And in fact, she, you know, she was a little bit obsessed with her cousins because they were older and they were cool and they got <laughs> to graze the goats and they never took her with them. And she, was, she, she started following them. And then when she followed them, like, like 
you know, the, the little pesky ones do. She saw stuff that no one else did. So everybody thought, okay, the girls are going to graze the goats, but the girls were teenagers and, you know, they were always talking the phone and they were secretly applying lipstick and they were writing romantic poems and they were teasing each other about boys. And so they had this life that was a kid's life in a village that nobody outside had ever heard of. And, uh, you know, so part of what I, was what I did was just talk to the people who, um, who knew them as they had been at that stage in their life, not as little girls and not how their parents imagined their lives would be because Padma was set to marry. She was 16. It is a marriageable age in many parts of India. Uh, she had already been taken out of school. So they were seeing her as a young woman who would marry in two years and have children and be respectable and safe because mm -hmm. marriage uh, in India is, uh, is, is that safety a net uh, or also parents think, you know, nobody can prey on her anymore. So her parents wanted her to be safe, but Padma wanted to be free and she just wanted to be 16. And that's the story that I tried to build. Oh, I love how you talk about both of them, Sonia. Um, for anybody who's just joining us, we're talking about Sonia's brilliant new book, The Good Girls. Um, so you said that, you know, what started this was seeing the picture of the two girls, their bodies hanging from a tree, which was circulated on Twitter. How did you know that there's a book here and you want to write it? So I wasn't planning to write a book about uh, this one case at all. Uh, you know, it was, like I said, a larger book about sexual violence, right? And mm -hmm. uh, one of the reasons that I chose this particular case, um, among tragically a plethora of others, was um, that, that, that the people said, and by people, I mean, not just, you know, people on social media, but TV stations, and then the newspapers, that the case was, quote, unquote, open and shut. The children, uh, people said, had- Wild. To they said they had gone out at night uh, to use the fields. Uh, they did not have a toilet at home. So they went out regularly at about 9 p.m. Padma and Lali together because they did everything together. And they always took their phone because, you know, the village uh, had, um, th th there were snakes, there were cobras in the field. There were all sorts of wild animals and there were a different kind of animal, which is uh, the, the bandits you know, actual groups of men who would come with their improvised guns to steal uh, motorbikes and grain, and some people said women. So the girls took the phone with them and they didn't show up. And then they were found, uh, when they were found, it was said that they had been snatched by members of the dominant Yadav caste. So the Yadavs, like uh, the family of Padma and Lali, are, are low caste, but they are politically powerful. And it was said that the Yadav men had snatched them, uh, raped them, killed them, and hanged them to make it look like they had died by suicide. But actually, uh, they, they weren't even pretending. It was mostly uh, you know, a show of, of power, that they could just take anything they wanted and do anything they wanted with it. So to me, because I had been w writing about uh, gender and, you know, uh, criminal investigations for a few years and had found them so very, very complex. Uh, you know, it really is often the case that uh, everybody sees, hears and experiences something different and their varying stories become the centerpiece because the science does not exist, you know. Um, police protect a crime scene by waving their arms as though, you know, people are pigeons. And then it just uh, disintegrates from there. So it, it, there was, uh, I, I cannot deny an appeal to the fact that this was open and shut. But I go to Katra, you know, expecting to stay for a week. And the families of, of the girls, uh, you know, the, the three brothers who live together and, um, they, are, they live, there are 18 of them, and they were all lovely, very gracious, very kind. They did not have to speak to me, having spoken to media from all over the world uh, for a year. 
and, and received nothing in return, of course, but they did. But it was also clear that, you know, something was not quite right. It was the, there were pieces missing from the jigsaw. Mm. And uh, at the end of the week, I, I knew that the investigations had been completed, right? There was nothing more to be done, but I was not confident that I understood what had happened to the children. And uh, so I thought, look, I can, I can find a new case, but then a new case will not be that different from this one because of how we investigate crimes in India. So perhaps I should just try and understand what has happened here. And that was when I decided that, you know, I would stick with this and, and continue to visit Katra and, and try and see if I got a handle on things. You know, hearing you speak about how, how complex it was and, and all, of, all of the various facets of indifference too, I was just thinking about, you know, there's a scene in the book where um, we go into what the, what the postmortem looked like. And it's such a, I think they just pull in a, a pretty inexperienced sweeper to perform it. And, you know, they don't really have the proper equipment. He uses a, a kitchen knife. It's, it's pretty, you know, the, the frankness um, of, you know, well, this is just what had to be done. And also the, the indifference, you know, there are lines about how politicians showed up, but all they had to do was show up. They didn't really feel like they had to do more beyond that. Um, you know, all of the indifference that I'm guessing you witnessed, what does it say about, about the value of a girl's life in this place? So when I talk about uh, Padma and Lali, you know, uh, I, I always say they were really loved. And this is an obvious thing, right? Because parents love their kids. Um, and yet I feel the need to reiterate this because Firstly, because I think as soon as that picture showed up on Twitter and those kids stopped being kids, they represented so many different things. You know, people started talking about how come there are no toilets six hours outside Delhi? And would this have happened if the schools were better? And, and is there any chance that India will ever uh, dismantle the caste system or, you know, why is politics so corrupted and so on and so forth. And the children began to just recede further and further away until they were just, they were not there. There were, there were blurred images where those children had once existed as a very important part of this tiny community where they were very well known and everybody knew their habits, you know, how they liked singing games and this one liked to eat mangoes and that one was a chatterbox. And, but that faded really, really quickly. And in that, in that space where those girls had just lived, right, they were right there. Other people's concerns, starting with this very real concern about survival, going all the way to, oh, you know, is this going to affect my chances of being elected? That is, that's what took over. So it, it started with, look, this is not good for how I'm going to be viewed as, as, a, as, a, as a father, as a parent. How does this affect who, you know, whether our sons are going to get married, who wants to marry their daughters into a village in which girls hang from trees and, and so on and so forth. And, you know, I think one part of it is that girls are, are severely undervalued. You know, I mean, severely, they are, and it is possible for both things to be true, that you love somebody uh, and you still undervalue them in comparison to pretty much anything else, you know? And it is true that you, 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 you recognize that this is an individual with rights and hopes and dreams. And at the same time, you treat them like a possession and a possession to be moved around, you know, almost like a chess piece. Okay, now you're going to go here. This is school. No, now you're going to come back. This is marriage. Now you're going to go in that direction, motherhood. And you just keep moving this person and that person has, has no agency. So all of these things are true. 
um, at the same time. And, and it, it's true that if the girls had been boys, we would be having a similar conversation. You know, I mean, it's it, it, one of the things that I hope to bring out in the book is that the lives of boys and men, uh, you know, in on one hand, you can't compare because of course they do have more agency, but how much more agency if you are also told what job to do and who to marry and when to have kids and who to, you know, where you can live and where a lot of your life as a male is, is censoring the women in the family, is, is controlling them, is telling them how to live. Um, that is also not something that a lot of young boys or men actually enjoy doing, but they feel this tremendous pressure to, to, to be the, the puppet masters, you know? So everybody is pushed into all of these corners and made to behave in certain ways. And at some point you don't know who, who is making them do this. You know, everybody is forcing everybody else to behave in, you know, in a way that nobody enjoys. Um, I don't think that girls and women are valued in India. I really don't. And I, I say that as somebody who, you know, grew up it feeling under threat, um, feeling scared, uh, feeling that, you know, I mean, if something happens, how, how you know, what, what I don't think that if, if I had, died in this village in the course of my reporting, I would also have received the same treatment as Padma and Lali. You know, this is not so much about poverty as it is about what life is like for all of us. It's just that we get distracted by the superficial things of, you know, like uh, where you live and, and what you sound like, but actually we are all subject to the same rules, the same moral codes and the same system. Absolutely. Everyone suffers in such a society. And, you know, I was thinking about this while listening to you just now is, yes, that feeling of you grew up in Mumbai, I grew up in Kolkata, they're both huge cities, um, but that sense of really relating to the restrictions upon the two girls in this book, you know, of always knowing that, you know, we, we went to school and you would frequently just be touched and groped by men on the bus and, you know, you take an auto and there's someone trying to touch you and, you yeah. know, we started talking about it among our friends and, you know, it was happening to everyone. So that sense of, you know, don't take a taxi alone you know if there's right. a boy with you someone's brother or something you know they drop you off first like all of that stuff that we were just like okay this is how it has to work you know we have to be home by 9 p.m and so on so i i think that you know you're you're so spot on in this book and that is all absolutely amplified in in this in this village um and you know the other thing that you touched on was that the parents, the family who decided to leave the bodies up so that yeah. this picture could circulate. I mean, they were doing it from a place of great love of trying to advocate for their girls in the way that they knew how, right? Because they knew the power of this image. They knew that this image would move people, would prompt questions in a way that perhaps nothing else would. Yeah, it was such a masterstroke, and I'm such a huge admirer of, uh, you know, of, of Padma and Lali's families because what they were responding to, Mega, was the with the with the protests of the 2012 Delhi bus raid. Hmm. They lived in a village where there were barely any TVs. They themselves did not have a television. They don't have radios. They don't read and write. But the news of that young woman's death and the subsequent protests and the response, the government's response had reached them and they understood the power of protest. And that was it, you know, they, they were protesting and they were willing to protest for as long as, as it took. And a lot of the people who came to inspect the girls, to came, who came to look at this family who dared to stop the police from taking down the bodies of the children for an autopsy, um, thought, gosh, these, these, these are very naive. They're just, you know, in their words, illiterate villagers, backward farmers. 
And they were not. They understood how India works. And how does India work? India doesn't respond to injustice. India responds to power. And power responds to attention. So as the parents said to the police, you're not coming near my children, the police grew frustrated and called for more police. A local journalist who happened to be upon the scene found it amusing that these farmers were standing up to the police and they made this into a story. And as it became a story, the media came and you know where the media goes, the politicians pay attention. And so that's how it became a story like no other since the bus rape. And, you know, within days of the, the children being found, there were similar incidents in that very state of girls and women being found hanging uh, in, in various parts of their village. And I only knew them as two or three lines in a paper. And then, you know, when I tried to follow up, I was always told, well, the case is closed because that's what happens, you know, if, if you don't, if you cannot stand up for yourself, uh, then people will do, will investigate the case the way they know. And unfortunately, they don't know. And they, they respond by closing the case. Uh, but the parents of Padma and Lali had anticipated exactly such behavior because they had grown up being treated like this. You know, they said for us, uh, you know, uh, the, the police see us as, as vermin. You know, we are merely to be crushed under their feet. So you can crush us, but you're not going to crush our daughters. And that incredible step uh, was, 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 was what gave their kids a fighting chance, I think. So moving, we're already, sorry about the fire engine that's just passing by. Um, we're already starting to get questions in the Q&A. For everybody watching, please do drop your questions in there. We will turn to them. Um, I, can, I can already start asking. So here's a question. The American media often mishandles crimes that involve girls and women. And it seems like that happened here as well. Um, oh, I think we kind of talked about it. It's about how, you know, the lives of girls are, are not really valued. Let's turn to a different one by Jaya. This is a powerful story. How do you want the world at large to respond to Padma and Lali's story? What policy changes do you hope for? Mm, this is really, really good. So I think that, you know, if, if you go to Katra village um, and you think about uh, you, you talk to the families of Padma and Lali and you say, you know, what what should have been different uh, to have to have, you know, prevented this from happening. Now, they'll give you one set of answers that I think is absolutely valid. So, uh, for example, uh, if there had been a school close by where Padma and Lali could have gone to after they had left, the eighth grade, because this local school was only till the eighth grade. And uh, the, the school, if to study more, they would have had to go out of the village. Uh, so the family will say, look, if we had a school where they could have completed their education in the village, the reason they can't send their children outside the village is because, and they'll say this, India is a dangerous place. And I'm not letting my girls leave the village. So my girls can't go to school. And if my girls can't go to school, they have to get married because girls can't sit at home they are vulnerable to assault. Mm -hmm. So you see here, if, if this is a, a, a legitimate concern, which it seems like to me, then I think that you need an investment in, uh, in, in uh, schools. In, and, and then of course, beyond that in education that actually allows, that empowers young men and young women uh, to get real jobs, because the standard of education in a lot of places, uh, and Katra is not the exception, is such that children learn very basic uh, language and, and math skills, but it is not enough to, it, it, you know, to actually do anything with. I mean, you can read a poem, but can you read a, an entire book? Right. So there are things that you can do to to protect children. Um, and, and, and to empower them, right? Girls and boys. We mustn't forget that boys also require those same rights. Mm -hmm. but there's something else here, you know, which is that 
that there are girls uh, in, in the village who do study further. Mm -hmm. and whose parents in similar socioeconomic standards and with the same very legitimate fears uh, do send their girls to study because they believe that education can make a difference. And remember, this was the case with the young woman in the Delhi, uh, to, in the 2012 bus rape. Her family was also from Uttar Pradesh, from similar circumstances. Her father was an airport porter and he worked double shifts and sold land because he wanted to educate his daughter. He had two sons, which, you know, if you know anything about Indian culture, you know that the sons will get the education, the sons will get the food and the vaccinations, the daughters will not. But his daughter got everything because of his belief, his faith, you know, uh, in what a, a child with an inquiring mind can achieve. Now, the families of Padman Lali thought differently. You know, there was no question of whether you have an inquiring mind or not, you will marry. So I think it's two things. You know, you do need, you know, you, you need tangible things, tangible things that people can access. But you also need something completely different. You need to try and understand how you can change hundreds of years of, 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 a, of a mindset that says girls are a burden, girls are dependent, girls are vulnerable, girls must be protected, and so on and so forth. So I think it is, it is both those things uh, that, that, that need to be done. Hmm. Here's another question, which I think I might um, put together with, with a similar question that I had. You know, the book touches on so many themes, you know, caste, poverty, honor, social media and phones, the justice system, corruption, um, and keeping all of that in mind, um, I'll put it together with this question, which is what do you hope readers think about and take away from this book after they've read it? When uh, I went to Kachra for the first time, you know, it was, it was with the understanding that a large number of people had done the girls wrong, had gone out of their way to do them harm from the time that they went missing to the time that their bodies were examined on the autopsy table and all the way into investigation one, investigation two, investigation three, to the steps of the court. That because these children belonged to a family that was poor and low caste in a in, in a part of the country uh, where, you know, one, one could easily dismiss as well, that's just how they are, that's how they do things. Um, they, they had been victims. And indeed, they had been victims. Uh, of course, there's no doubt about that. But not of any malice. It was simply that people either didn't care enough or they didn't know enough. And in fact, you know, talking to everybody, uh, you know, for example, Lalaram, you mentioned him, the, the gentleman who conducted the autopsy, who was, and this is so unbelievable even to me now when I'm saying the words, he was a hospital sweeper. And he had got the job because the previous person who, who conducted the autopsies, who was also a hospital sweeper, had quit. And so Lala Ram was given the job with the promise of a, of a bigger salary. He was trained for 15 days. And then he went to the bazaar and brought he, bought his instruments from, from the vegetable market. You know, his knives, his weighing scales were the kind of scales that you use to weigh aloo sabzi, onions and potatoes, right? But Lala Ram, did the best job that he could. He would have treated me the same way and you and anybody else. So this is what it is. It's, you know, we, we attribute to malice what is actually a lack of interest. And there's something much deeper. We need to understand why people, large numbers of people in critical jobs don't really care enough. And it could be one reason is you could say, you know, a very basic and straightforward reason, well, they're not paid enough. Another reason is they're not trained enough. And a third reason could be that nobody above them cares enough to make them do their job. You know, so it is a case that from top to bottom, there's just, everybody is showing up for work, but nobody's actually doing the job 
for which they're paid. And that to me is much more terrifying uh, than the fact that people went out of their way to harm the girls. Yeah. Um, I want to switch gears for one second and ask you, I'm sure there are lots of emerging writers and journalists in the room watching. What is your, what is your advice for um, emerging journalists and writers to do this kind of work, to do this kind of sensitive um, kind of long interviews to understand these people and this place. What is advice that you may have received which was helpful to you? I think it's, um, it's, it's always daunting at the beginning of any book project, as you would know. You know, you're at the, the bottom of the mountain and you don't know how to scale it. And in this case, it was particularly tricky because of um, the, the various things that I mentioned to you. Uh, one of the challenges that I faced was that, you know, some people, um, despite my best efforts, felt that they had to protect themselves by repeating certain falsehoods, which I completely understand, you know, uh, first of all, why talk to a journalist, you know, I wouldn't do it. So you know, you shouldn't either. And, uh, and if you think that you're going to compromise your 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 uh, your witness statement by talking to a, a frankly, a random stranger who shows up, why would you do it? This is a uh, perfectly natural, it happens, but when it, it happens to you, it, it can be uh, quite unnerving because you think, you know, how do I chisel the truth out of this individual? And in, in my experience, you don't. Um, I have found that the best way to get around this is to talk to more people. There is very rarely just one witness uh, and in this case, there were dozens of witnesses to various events that took place um, in, in, in the course of that one night when the children went missing. So how I responded uh, was, was to interview a large number of people and then to cross check their stories and then to take that information, the, the real information back to those people who had been reluctant to talk to me and to present it to them and then ask them if they wanted to, to comment. And it was always the case that they would then comment uh, simply because they understood that this person is going to do the job one way or the other and, you know, I, I might as well, I, I might as well participate, and that's 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 one thing I learned in the course of this. I've also been marveling at the at the structure of this book. It holds so much. The pace is, you know, it moves so quickly. It keeps you turning the pages, keeps you reading. Um, how did you structure this book? So I, I think it happened after I did several drafts. Uh, you know, the, the the first draft, I always make the same mistake I did with Beautiful Thing as well. It was so like in the well of the story that it was like nothing else existed. And that's not good as well, right? Because it may seem like you have the momentum and the experience of that life, but you don't have the context. And without context, the story does not work. And then in the next draft, I was just so full of context that, you know, the story didn't move because I would say, okay, here, so here's the policeman beating Papu with, you know, a, a piece of rubber. And then I would go into a paragraph about you know, human rights abuses in India. And, and you know, there was over uh, contextualizing. And then I just found that the more drafts I did, and I'm a huge fan of reading aloud, um, I could get a sense of the momentum. And momentum is so important for me in the kind of work I do because so much of my work deals with stories that people don't want to read uh, because they are hard to read. And also because they think, look, I, are you seriously going to tell me anything new about gender violence in India or about poverty? And the answer is yes, I actually am. Um, but I need, to make sure that you stay with the story. And that is, you know, that is with the structure and that is with the momentum. And I actually like that because it's quite technical and I like the whole construction, you know, um, I enjoy that. I think that's the part that I enjoy most as a writer. 
we have more questions coming in. Um, let me see. Um, somebody's asking, I'm going to paraphrase a little bit. Carol is asking um, about grassroots organizations led by women or serving women in India. Um, would you like to say anything about the nonprofit scene, women activists, anything that you may have seen that I guess gives us reason to, to hope? I think there is a, a lot of activity happening um, on the ground, but they're not large organizations. You know, they're actually small village groups that work very close to the people uh, who they are trying to encourage to, to send their kids to school or to use clean water or, uh, you know, visit the doctor regularly, that actual doctor, rather than going to a village qua a quack. So there is a lot of that activity. Um, it, it tends to be a little bit under the radar, I think, because uh, communities are close-knit and conservative and they don't in many cases appreciate anybody coming from the outside and and telling them especially the women how to do things because you know that requires uh the activists to talk to the women separately because in the, women don't in, in places in uttar pradesh women often are uncomfortable talking in the presence uh, of of men women in these particular situations so because it affects the village dynamics of power um you know that the work is not something that one can often see or even talk about but one of the organizations that I do like and that I can talk about is, is a group of journalists, Mega, that you've uh, heard of, I'm sure, called Kabar Leheria. And uh, it's a group of uh, women who report their own stories, publish their own stories, and have a wonderful newspaper that is really sort of like the heartbeat of uh, that part of Uttar Pradesh in which they work. So if anybody is interested in... Um, in, 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 in supporting their work, please, please do go online. You'll, you'll find them quite easily. That sounds great. Thanks for sharing, Sonia. And now would be an amazing moment for everybody to click that link in the chat and make sure you have it open so you can buy your copy of The Good Girls as soon as we wrap up. It's a really brilliant book. Um, I think it will leave you with so much to think about. Um, and perhaps we can go to our last question. Um, oh, somebody's telling you that you're an outstanding writer. This is Shobha and she loved beautiful girls. Um, but here's a, um, here's a question from Lynn. What long lasting impact has the Delhi bus rape case had, if any? What is your hope for the impact of this book on criminal justice system reform in India? I, I think that the, the Delhi bus rape has had a, a, a profound impact you know just number one we are talking about sexual assault in india which prior to 2012 we did not do we didn't do it at our dinner tables we didn't do it in the news media uh we didn't do it at all i mean we maybe had hushed conversations and by we i mean groups of women about our fears for ourselves it never went beyond that and now it is a national topic it is almost an, an, an obsession. And of course, we saw changes to the law and we saw investments uh, that that were supposed to, you know, was supposed to um, help ensure women's safety. Hasn't all worked out the way that we had hoped, but the, the fact is that uh, it, it made a huge difference. And, you know, with this particular case, uh, I, I think it's, not quite gotten the family what they had hoped for. I mean, uh, that is the, that is the unfortunate truth. But I do hope that by reading the book, and there can be certain changes. And I, I think, you know, for example, we do need medical professionals to examine bodies. I feel like this doesn't need to be said. And yet here I am saying it. So in a country that is obsessed with 
everybody being either a doctor or an engineer. I don't understand why doctors are not doing the work of doctors. So that is certainly one place that we need to, we need to and we can make changes. You know, another place is, is simply introducing science. And again, you know, India is supposed to be one of the world capitals of science. Everybody seems to talk about science all the time. And here we are, this basic science is not being followed. In this case, for example, the, the crime scene was left open not for a few minutes or an hour, days, weeks. I mean, people just walked in like it was a tourist attraction. So you have to pay attention to these things, these things that actually all of us care about, but somehow are not converting into action. So these are, I would say, two very specific things, and there are many, many more, but these are two things that we might change. Well, on that note, thank you so much, Sonia. I'm so glad for the chance to chat with you today. Everybody, read The Good Girls. Um, sorry to embarrass you by hawking your book a million times, Sonia. <laughs> but it is so thank good. Thank you so much. Thank you. This was, um, this was so great. Thank you for your time. I'm so glad you liked the book. My pleasure. And thank you to Brittany and Politics and Prose and everybody who watched. Thank you both so much for doing this. I think even though these books are slightly different genres, Mega, you and Sonia's books are this like beautiful pairing. I think they would go so well together because there are so many shared themes. So I have dropped the link for both of these women's books in the chat. Um, make sure you pick those up. And thank you so much to everyone who attended. Um, we hope that you're staying safe, staying well, and staying well read. We'll see you next time.